Good morning and welcome to everybody. And I'm here with Adam. Adam is uh, hails from Ohio originally, right? And yep. um, but you were living down in Florida for a while, so he was. You've been complaining about the temperatures up here, but it's getting a little bit better now, right? It's getting closer. It's, it's approaching the humidity levels. <laughs> yeah, he likes uh, full heat and humidity. Oh, okay. What I don't like, but that is not what I like. So, so Adam um, works at the Applied Research Lab at Penn State. He also teaches. Uh, he's te taught uh, fluid dynamics at, at Penn State, and maybe you tell us a little bit about like what it's been like. Uh, I'm sure when you signed up for the class to teach uh, fluid dynamics, you didn't know that you were going to be entering into a pandemic. So what was it like, uh, kind of, that transition that you had to go through in, in teaching? Sure. Well, I mean, signing up for the class, that was my first class that I've taught, period. So <laughs> there was some adjustments on that level. And then having the pandemic come through, it's halfway through the semester, you throw out the playbook and, and learn something new. And uh, it taught me a lot about kind of the other side of the student experience and um, kind of dealing with their anxieties and the types of things that they have to face during the semester while also how best to teach them technical content, which is maybe on third or fourth on everybody's priority list when the pandemic hits. <laughs> right. and, yeah, and of course you, you were teaching an easy course like fluid dynamics. Right, piece exactly. Of cake, piece everybody, of cake. everybody had hundreds coming into the pandemic. And, <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, it was a difficult course for sure, and um, I think um, that level or that, that type of course wakes some students up for the first time in some of these programs anyways, and then especially having to deal with all these things, it's right. uh, definitely a growth experience for some people. Oh yeah, that's a lot of challenges with a lot of this stuff. So I just kind of wanted to remind you all that um, <laughs> you can uh, get these devotions at Good Shepherd sc.org we load them up there and if you have prayer requests pastor b spang at comcast.net pastor b spang at comcast.net we're gonna be in romans chapter 7 today it's a beautiful morning out here I'm able to sit out here and we're not freezing you know a couple times we've had guys out here we had jackets on <laughs> look you can see our breath when we're talking but uh, today it's, uh, it's 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 nice and nice and yeah, mild very warm nice. in there so romans chapter 7 uh, this is a great chapter here, uh, where Apostle Paul, later in this chapter, speaks to our struggle with sin, and really, it's a struggle that we all have. So let's uh, let's take a look. Romans chapter 7. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man only as long as he lives? For example, <clears throat> by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. So then if she marries another while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who raised you from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies, so that we bore fruit of death, fruit for death. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written law. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what law was except through the law, ex what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment, put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me, through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the sin 
who know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sin, sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now I do what I do not want to do. It is no longer I who do it, but it is, it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. All right. Very challenging stuff here. So let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for this time together, for your presence in our life, for, um, for your grace that is needed each and every day in our lives. So we pray that you would open our hearts and minds to you and teach us now from your word what it looks like to follow Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We pray in his mighty name. Amen. So I, I, I just noticed that um, I forgot to plug the microphone in, but we're getting the camera microphone. Hopefully you can hear it's okay, but it's probably not as much uh, volume as you would normally have. So we're just going to speak up and, and hopefully you can hear us okay. Um, <clears throat> so if you're looking at this, he uses this kind of illustration for marriage. He could have, uh, he's, he's talking about uh, a man and woman being married, and, and if someone dies in that relation, either the man or the woman, then they're freed from their marriage vows, and they're free to marry somebody else. So he says, he's just using that as an illustration, one simple illustration, to say, hey, the, that law is no longer applicable after, after death. So... He then turns and says in verse 4, So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who raised you from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit, um, bear fruit to God. So, here it is. When we're coupled with the law, uh, and we're thinking that the law is what is going to save us, then um, that brings death really to us because all of us have violated the, the law and continue to violate the law and we know uh, that the wages as we saw in Romans 6 23 the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is an eternal life in Christ Jesus so he's saying here that we died to that lifestyle of thinking that we're going to make ourselves right with God by following the law so that's not what we're under anymore Instead, we've been united with Christ by His grace and raised to, new, to newness of life. So that's, you know, we're raised to Him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit to God. In other words, we've been united with Christ, no longer under the penalty of the law. The law is still, the moral law is still applicable, but we're not under the penalty of the law because Christ paid the price for us. We're raised to life. Now we're living by grace to bear fruit. To bear fruit in Christ, so that's that's really what he's getting at in, in on all of this. Um, so, and then he goes on in some illustrations when we were controlled by the sinful nature, uh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies. Have you ever kind of? I don't know about you, but I struggle with things in my life. And here's the thing: if I I think to myself and I kind of are, say. I'm not going to do that anymore, or this. I'm not going to go down that path anymore in my life, and I start thinking about it, it seems like the more I think about how I'm not going to follow that path, that sinful path, the more likely I'm to stumble and fall into that sinful path, into that sinful path. So when we live by the law, it kind of almost arouses, hey, I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to go down that path, I'm going to try that, I'm going to do that. And so... To me, what the scripture really says to us is, and I think what's true in our lives, is that when sin is defeated not by saying, today I'm going to 
crush it. Today I'm not. I'm going to just not going to do that thing that I don't want to do anymore. It's when we live by grace, which is something more beautiful. So the sin, which has a certain enticing value to it, is replaced by something greater. And that is the grace of God found in Jesus. So that is what I should be focusing on so that the other stuff starts to kind of fade away. Instead of saying, oh, I'm going to focus on, oh, I, I'm messing up in this area of the law, and I need to kind of do this, this, and this, and then I actually wind up doing it. Right. <laughs> so then he, that's when he goes on to um, the struggling with sin. Um, I don't know. <laughs> this is just uh, this is just the reality uh, for all of us. He, he he talks about you know hey uh, so he goes, so verse twelve. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means, but in order that sin might be recognized as sin and produce it produced death to me through what was good, so that the commandment that the, through the commandment sin might become utterly sinful and so this is what we call in uh, Lutheran theology the uh, the first use of the law that the law is like as a giant mirror so that I can see myself as I truly am and so when sometimes when people come to faith in Christ maybe as an adult there's some big things in their life they're like wow man that's, I really blew it in here and, and, and that's what they're thinking about when they kind of come to faith in Christ and forgiveness they receive. But when I read the scripture, I recognize it's like an un layers of an onion. It's like, oh, well, I'm not really struggling with that anymore, but I'm still, man, I'm yeah. still struggling over this here. Oh, when Jesus says, love your enemies? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I guess I'm going to be nice to that guy over there. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, these, I think, if we're honest, when we read this, it makes sin become utterly sinful. Right? That's yeah. what he says. Sin becomes utterly sinful. And if we were left there, it'd be very depressing. But um, and he goes through this whole thing. I, I love that section, verses fourteen and following. That's what, you know why I had yeah. you read that is because that's the tongue twister, and I would have messed that, that up. That is my best. But yeah. you did a good job <laughs> reading that. That which I want to do, I don't do the very things I don't want to do. Yeah. Those things I, I keep on doing and. Who among us, I uh, can't say that, that, that that's true for us. It's, it's true for each one of us. You know, how many times in your life have you said, I'm never going to do that again? Well, I'm not even sure I can count in one day how many times you <laughs> say that. Yeah, yeah verse 15. <laughs> yeah, that's the mirror. Yeah, it's a giant mirror for us to say, this is how I truly am. And I love the way he, um, he then finish off this chapter because um, he, he comes to the conclusion, verse 24, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Now that would be very depressing if that's where he left off. But look, look at this, verse 25, here it is. The good news for you, the good news for me, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. So he recognizes his struggle, which is the struggle we all have, but he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the where the that's where the victory is. He is the one who has conquered sin, death, and the devil for us. I haven't conquered sin. He's the one who's conquered it. Adam's conquered it, but no. <laughs> no. Maybe not. Yeah, no, no, it's already too late in the day. <laughs> I've been defeated. Yeah, been defeated, right? Yeah, so, you know, people sometimes, and, and if you think about it, every other religion in the world, that's what they're looking to. They're like, today, if I do this, this, and this, I might make myself right with God. How far into the day before you sin in thought, word, or deed? Remember, God knows your motives. God knows why you're doing the things you're doing. Uh, and, you know, as we said before, if God could read your mind, how many friends would you have? How many? <laughs> I have to read zero. <laughs> zero friends. So, anyway, we need the grace of God. That's really what he's, he's coming down to. All of us are in this struggle uh, together, and we need God's grace and forgiveness.
Is there anything else that they dumped out of you? That... Well, it's just so, so much of this message of Christ's mercy for us. It, it, the message, it crushes the prideful ego and it heals the broken heart. It's just a beautiful, beautiful tool in our lives. And that's what the church is here, we're here for, uh, to, to heal. We're a hospital. We're all in need of the hospital. Much more deadly than the pandemic that's going around is, is all of this. All right, well, let's uh, maybe we'll have a, a final prayer together. Gracious Father, we come in your presence and are thankful for this day. Once again, uh, thank you for Adam. I pray for your blessing to be upon him this day. Uh, thankful for opportunities to just enjoy the beauty of your creation, to be out here with the birds chirping. Uh, be with each and every person that is listening to this. Bless their day. Fill them with the joy of your salvation, that we would look to you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Thank you for holding us in your nail-scarred hands, Jesus. It's the best place to be. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Have a blessed day. Take care.